Welcome everyone to the first uh, webinar hosted by the Center for Constitutional Studies in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. My name is Pat Parody and I'm the Executive Director of the Center and I will be moderating this webinar today. We're very fortunate to have with us two leading lights in the law, uh, Professors David Dysonhaus from the University of Toronto and Paul Daly from the University of Ottawa. Welcome who will discuss emergency powers and legal principle in the time of COVID-19. So specifically, they're going to be addressing how do governments choose to exercise their powers in the context of a pandemic such as the one in which we find ourselves? And what are some useful frameworks and safeguards to think about in relation to what can become the slow and steady encroachment of government power in times like these? It's easy to forgive governments their power grabs in the middle of a crisis, but as we all know, our fundamental democratic rights can be significantly eroded during these times, and it's critical to maintaining a healthy democracy that we remain vigilant in the face of the power usurping potential of governments. So we're, we're very uh, excited to begin and to hear from you on, on the issue of emergency powers and legal principle. And, but before I uh, introduce you, just for our audience members, the format for the webinar today is as follows. First, note that the chat function during the webinar has been disabled, but uh, audience members and participants do have the ability to ask questions of our uh, presenters, and you just have to go to the bottom of your screen. There's a question and answer button there, Q&A on the bottom. You will not be able to see each other's questions, but the presenters will be able to see your, qu your questions, and we will get to as many of them as we can uh, after their presentations. They will speak for 10, well, 15 to 20 minutes each, and so there should be ample time for questions after the presentations. Also, please note that you will receive a short feedback form or survey after the presentation today, and we would appreciate it tremendously if you would fill it out. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us. Lastly, please note that the webinar is being recorded and that it will be available on our website. So now um, I'll begin by introducing both our speakers and uh, then I will invite David to begin. So David Dysonhaus is a professor of law and philosophy at the University of Toronto where he holds the ABLE Chair of Law and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He holds a doctorate from Oxford University and both law and undergraduate degrees from the University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa. Professor Dysonhaus has taught and been a visiting fellow at several universities around the world, and he is a Guggenheim Fellow in this academic year. He's the author of a large number of significant texts, including Hard Cases in Wicked Legal Systems, South African Law in the Perspective of Legal uh, Philosophy, now in its second edition, Legality and Legitimacy, Carl Schmidt, Hans Kelsen, and Hermann Heller in Weimar, and Judging the Judges, Judging Ourselves, Truth, Reconciliation, and the Apartheid Legal Order. He has edited and co-edited several collections of uh, essays, notably in 2006, The Constitution of Law, Legality in the Time of Emergency. He is the editor of the University of Toronto Law Journal and co-editor of the series Cambridge Studies in Constitutional Law. And now for Professor Paul Daly. Paul Daly holds the University Research Chair in Administrative Law and Governance at the University of Ottawa, to which he was recruited from the Faculty of Law, University of Cambridge. Previously, he was successively Assistant Professor, Associate Dean and Associate Professor at the Faculty de Droit and Université de Montréal, and held visiting positions at Harvard Law School and Université Paris Panthéon Assas. A graduate of University College Cork, BCL LLM, the University of Pennsylvania Law School, LLM, and the University of Cambridge, his PhD. His influential scholarly work on public law, dozens of books, peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and shorter pieces has been widely cited, including by the Supreme Court of Canada, various other Canadian courts and tribunals, the Irish Supreme Court, and the High Court of Australia. His blog, Administrative Law Matters, was the first blog ever cited by the Supreme Court of Canada. And since September, First, 2019, he has been a part-time, he is a part-time reviewer 
Officer of the Environmental Protection Tribunal of Canada. And so now, without further ado, would you uh, please begin your presentation, David? Thank you. Let me see if I can get this going. Right, I, th I think I have everything up now. Well, th thank you very much for uh, having me on this uh, webinar. Uh, as uh, you will have gathered from uh, Pat's very kind words about me at the beginning, I come from South Africa and what you will have seen before you saw my slideshow, I think, is a photo of my friends and myself in the Kruger Park in South Africa. But let me then proceed to my slideshow, which as you'll see from the title is about emergencies and the rule of law in a time of COVID. And it seems to me that uh, there are two questions if we're going to be discussing uh, the current public health crisis and the issue of emergency that arise at a fairly abstract level. And these questions are, uh, can the rule of law prevail during a time of emergency, which is not a question, of course, tied to the current public health crisis. But then there is the question that is tied to the current problem. Does the fact that it is a public health emergency affect the answer to the first uh, question? And it seems to me that one of the issues is, that we face is that uh, the enemy, uh, so to speak here, is uh, not a, uh, a political force that's somehow seeking to undermine uh, the political order. Rather, we have uh, this uh, non-human non enemy that uh, somehow affects us all. And because it affects us all, or potentially affects us all, I, th I think there is a tendency during a public health emergency for people to be a little less vigilant than they would ordinarily be during a uh, political emergency. And uh, that raises its own uh, problems. And I'm going to get to those problems by putting up a slide of someone who's regarded as uh, the foremost theorist of emergencies during the 20th century, that's the person who, facing my slide is on the right, not in uniform, uh, Carl Schmidt, uh, the conservative German uh, public lawyer and political theorist, sitting with a friend in uh, Wehrmacht uh, uniform during the uh, Second World War, or at least during the late 1930s. And uh, I would think that uh, many of the people who are uh, listening to this webinar will have noticed uh, Schmidt's name cropping up, which is quite interesting because uh, until a few years ago, he was relatively unknown in the English speaking world. But now that we are living in a time of uh, emergency, there is uh, frequent reference uh, to Schmidt in uh, periodicals and in uh, the mainstream media. And that is because uh, Schmidt, during the Weimar period, so uh, roughly 1919 to 1933, when Hitler came to power, came up with some striking formulations which organized his uh, theory of emergency. The first, which is from his book, uh, Political Theology, and it's the first line of his book, is uh, sovereign is he who decides on the exception, where exception uh, you can just take as a, another uh, way of referring to an emergency. And this line of Schmitz is uh, well known because uh, there's an ambiguity deliberately built into the line. And the ambiguity that's built into it is that the uh, sovereign is someone who uh, not only decides when there's a state of emergency, but who decides how to respond to that state of emergency. So the idea here is that sovereignty is revealed in abnormal times. We'll find out who our political and legal sovereign uh, really is. A book written some 10 years later, The Concept of the Political, Schmidt says that the concept of the state presupposes the concept of the political and that the specific political distinction is that between friend and enemy. The distinction is between who's in the political community and who's out. And when the sovereign decides on the exception, the distinction that the sovereign makes between friend and enemy will be uh, the uh, decision that will tell us who is in the political community and who is out. And uh, this uh, raises the uh, difficulty that I mentioned just a moment ago with uh, the previous slide. And that is, the enemy here is not a political enemy. So how do, does this uh, line of thought apply to our current uh, problems? 
last uh, bit of Schmidt's thought that I wanted to highlight from you uh, comes from uh, an essay. It's the title of the essay, but also the theme of the essay that he wrote in 1929 when the writing seemed to be on the wall for the Weimar Republic, his essay, The Guardian of the Constitution, in which he argues that, uh, at least in the circumstances of Weimar Germany, the chief executive is the ultimate guardian of the Constitution. And that thought then links up to the very first uh, quotation from Schmidt. Uh, we will find out in a state of emergency that our true political sovereign is uh, the chief executive. Now, the, the worry that I think emerges when we go back to the two questions that I had on the first slide, can the rule of law control a state of emergency? Uh, what difference does it make that it's a public health emergency? Uh, the, the worry that arises uh, in this context is that under the circumstances of a public health emergency, it might be possible, as it were, uh, for uh, the Schmittian argument to win by default at a time when everyone uh, is fearful because of the public health emergency, uh, we have to be vigilant about a tendency of uh, our political leaders to try to accrue more power. And this is going to be particularly true of uh, leaders who have uh, already autocratic uh, tendencies. Here's one dramatic example of uh, what happens, not during a public health emergency, but this uh, Photo is of the Reichstag, the German parliament fire in 1933, probably set by the Nazis in order to create a sense of panic among the German people. And in the wake of the Reichstag power, uh, fire, Hitler, as I'm sure you will all know, uh, gets a thoroughly cowled parliament to uh, pass the Enabling Act of 1933. And what does the Enabling Act do? The Enabling Act effectively uh, passes uh, legislative power to the chief executive, uh, that is to Hitler. From 1933 on, uh, although it, to some extent uh, ordinary legal order uh, still manages to function, ultimately the Führer, the leader's word, is uh, the law. Now 1933 is a long time ago, but if we fast forward to uh, our time, here we have a, a slide with a photo of uh, two leaders who have autocratic tendencies, uh, Donald Trump and Viktor Orban. And as many of you uh, will have uh, noticed, uh, just last month in Hungary, Orban used uh, the uh, state of uh, public health emergency in Hungary to uh, get the Hungarian parliament to enact his own version of uh, the Enabling Act. One can't uh, get uh, the full picture from this uh, brief quotation from uh, the statute, but now it is the case in, uh, a, in Hungary uh, that without any uh, time limit, Orban has exactly the kind of uh, legislative power concentrated in his executive office that Hitler managed to contrive in uh, 1933. And uh, if you're interested in finding out more about Hungary and the deeply troubling state of affairs there. Right at the end of uh, his slides, uh, Paul Daly has a, uh, a reference to a German website for Fassungsblog, and on that uh, website you'll find several pieces that analyze uh, the state of emergency in Hungary, as well as many pieces that deal with uh, the states of emergency in other countries. Now, I think that uh, it's probably foolhardy to assume that uh, we in Canada are immune to these sorts of tendencies. So I thought I would flash back to uh, the 1970s and to the invocation of the War Measures, War Measures Act to deal with the October crisis. And there you have uh, the military on uh, the streets of uh, Montreal. And here's one of those iconic photos. There's uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau in his just uh, watch me moment when the reporters challenge him and say to him, are you really going to invoke the War Measures Act? You can't do that. And he says, uh, just watch me and throw it away. Now, this uh, I think was a deeply troubling episode for the rule of law in, in Canada. But uh, fortunately it wasn't followed by uh, an autocratic leader using a state of emergency to accrue e even more power unto himself. 
rather, and I don't need to tell anyone this, what we get in uh, the 1980s is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so when it comes to replacing the War Measures Act with a, uh, a what we might think of as a properly modern uh, Emergencies Act in 1985, we get the preamble of the Act, making it clear that in a state of emergency, that is when the federal government uh, is involved in declaring a state of emergency, the rights and freedoms that we like to think we can take for granted in Canada are going to be uh, respected. So the preamble to the Act says, as you can see there, there that whereas the governing council in taking such special temporary measures would be subject not only to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but also must have regard to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and in particular to those fundamental rights that are not to be limited or abridged even in a national emergency. So there, going more to the topic of uh, Paul Daly's talk, it seems that under the Emergencies Act, certain rights might not be subject to uh, proportional uh, limitation. This act is uh, a very interesting act to read because it is uh, unusually well crafted with an eye on uh, rule of law controls. So just to highlight uh, a, a couple of the provisions, section 8.3 makes it clear that uh, the powers under the act are, will be exercised or performed in a manner that, not does, that does not interfere with uh, the provinces. And indeed, the uh, tone of the act is uh, a, a one uh, that uh, emphasizes uh, federal cooperation with the provinces. And while, as uh, you might recall, at uh, the beginning of uh, the current uh, health crisis, it did seem at times that the federal government was signaling that it was about to uh, uh, proclaim a federal state of emergency. Nevertheless, as things have turned out, uh, it's been clear that uh, the uh, federal government has been involved in intense consultation with the provinces and has, I think, by now decided to leave the provinces to deal with the situation uh, in their uh, jurisdictions according to their own sense of uh, the emergency situation there. Some further provisions. Section 10 provides that Parliament may re revoke a declaration of a state of emergency. Uh, Section 58 requires that reasons have to be laid before both Houses of Parliament within seven sitting days of the declaration. Section 59 permits a small number of the members of either House to bring a motion that the declaration be revoked. And Section 62 requires that a joint committee be established to review the performance of duties and functions pursuant to a declaration of uh, um, emergency. And uh, so if one goes back to uh, Schmidt and his uh, thought that in a situation of emergency, the executive gets to decide, and that uh, has implicit within it the claim that the rule of law cannot control the state of emergency, one might suppose that the Emergencies Act in Canada is a kind of refutation of Sch Schmidt because a federal state of emergency would come with a pretty robust rule of law controls. However, uh, one shouldn't be uh, too sanguine about uh, things. For, uh, one, uh, for one thing, it is the case that uh, Parliament is going to find it difficult during a public health emergency to convene in a way that can ensure that the executive is properly accountable to Parliament. And uh, as you know, and there may be uh, some judges, I suppose, listening to us, the, the courts are not sitting as they usually do, which means that accountability to uh, the courts is something that's not easy to achieve. It's, there's also the problem that while it is the case that uh, we might think that we are blessed in, in that uh, there hasn't been this gathering of power unto the center. And so the uh, emergency is being dealt with in a relatively uh, decentralized way, that's by the provinces. Nevertheless, the fact that it's being dealt with in this relatively decentralized way means that it's not visible nationally uh, 
uh, so clearly what's happening in the provinces. And it might be that had there been a federal state of emergency declared, uh, Canadians as a, as a nation might have been more vigilant about what was happening uh, during this time. A further problem that I, I, I would like to point to, and this will bring my uh, presentation to a close, is that insofar as the federal government has taken action so far, that action has been taken under uh, the Federal Quarantine Act. And the Federal Quarantine Act gives the government wide emergency powers without any of the safeguards that are built into uh, the, uh, the Emergencies Act. And the only kind of uh, review that, as far as I can tell, is available under the Quarantine Act is a review by designated public officials. And I'm sure that the courts could get in, get in on the action if uh, that was uh, necessary. But uh, the state of emergency under the Quarantine Act looks much uh, less rule of law friendly than the state of emergency under that would have happened had the uh, Emergencies Act been invoked. So while at the moment I personally uh, don't feel any great sense of trepidation about what the federal government is doing, or for that matter about what uh, provincial governments are doing or uh, what uh, municipalities are doing, nevertheless I do think it's important that as lawyers we remain vigilant in Canada when it comes to uh, concerns about uh, the rule of law during a public health emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting note upon which to finish. And so, uh, so we'll move on now then to, uh, to Paul Daly's presentation. And um, so without further ado, Paul, please carry on. Thank you, Patricia. Um, thank you, David. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have tuned in. Um, I'm going to talk about um, emergency powers and, uh, and legal principles as well. Um, the, um, uh, the perspective I'm going to adopt is the perspective of uh, proportionality, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but I thought I should start by way of introduction, uh, talking a little bit about uh, how to frame or how to think of the COVID-19 pandemic as a lawyer. Um, so for me, uh, my formative years as a lawyer uh, were the years of the war on terror uh, and my first exposure to uh, emergency powers and debates about emergency powers were in that context. It seems to me, and of course we can debate this, but it does seem to me that there is a difference between the war on COVID-19 and the war on terror. Certainly there will be similarities, but if we think about the effects of the war on COVID-19 so far, we're talking about restrictions on civil liberties, uh, our ability to assemble, to move. Um, and these are perhaps similar to some of the restrictions that the war on terror brought, but we're also seeing restrictions on property rights, your ability to run a business, your ability to access your property in different parts of the country or the world, and your economic freedom, your ability to go and work is affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, your freedom to go and spend money is affected by the response to the present emergency. This, I think, is, is different from the war on terror. Another difference is that the restrictions, at least for the most part, and at least for now, apply across the board. They apply to everybody. They're not targeted against a particular minority, a particular group. Uh, we're all affected by uh, the restrictions associated with the response to COVID-19. Now, that's not to say that the burdens are evenly distributed, because they are not. Uh, there are some uh, in the public sector, uh, university professors uh, and other professionals uh, who are not affected as much as uh, frontline healthcare workers, uh, frontline service workers in grocery shops or driving the trucks uh, across the country or working on the front lines in meatpacking plants uh, exposed to great danger. Uh, 
And of course, people who work in the service industry, in restaurants and cafes, uh, they are unable to work because of the shutdowns that the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have caused. Another difference, I think, is that if we think about how governments use their power, there's an old distinction made by Terence Deanteth, a, a British uh, legal academic, between imperium, dominium, and suasion. The imperium is the use of force, dominium is the use of uh, government largesse and contracting, and suasion is the use of information and advice. Uh, in this crisis, we've had some imperium. Uh, David mentioned the, the Quarantine Act, and certainly being forcibly quarantined is uh, a classic example of imperium, of the state bringing the force of law to bear upon you. Um, but much of the response has been uh, government largesse uh, in the form of emergency benefits to individuals and businesses to help to tide them over as uh, we go through a period of uh, unprecedented economic shutdown. Uh, governments are scrambling to contract to buy masks and other protective equipment which would be needed to uh, keep uh, frontline workers and others safe uh, as uh, we fight the the pandemic and the economy gradually reopens. They've also used um, suasion, information and advice. So the Ontario government here sent out an alert on cell phones last month. Um, the uh, daily newspaper that I receive invariably has a full page advertisement uh, imploring us to stay home and stay safe. Now, these are uses of, uh, of information and persuasion. And governments have also used uh, quite a bit of soft law uh, as opposed to hard law in the form of legislation and regulations. Uh, there has been a lot of guidance in Ontario, for example, uh, visitation policies in hospitals, uh, memorandums have been circulated by provincial officials uh, to advise hospitals on what to do in terms of visitation. Uh, these do not have the force of law, but they're nonetheless very important. So uh, the official responses to the COVID-19 pandemic do involve some use of law, uh, but involve an awful lot of government largesse, government contracting, and soft law, uh, which as we'll see at the, the end of the presentation, are harder for courts to control or oversee. The last point I would make uh, is to say that the normal channels of accountability are not functioning optimally, if at all. Uh, David mentioned the courts, uh, which have been uh, shut down or um, uh, laterally uh, proceeding uh, by electronic means, uh, but also Parliament is uh, not functioning uh, as it uh, normally does. Um, and as we'll see, it's very important to keep uh, holding governments to account at this point in time. Which brings me to what public lawyers might do or say or think about the current crisis. And I think uh, proportionality is a helpful tool in thinking about the current situation. Now, proportionality, of course, is mo most familiar to us from its use uh, by courts in human rights cases in the form of the, the Oaks test or some of the uh, international uh, equivalents. Uh, it certainly could be used in charter challenges that are brought to some of the uh, emergency measures, uh, but it's also a useful analytical tool, I think, uh, when we consider the problem of this pandemic and governmental responses to it. Now, I would emphasize that it's a tool, not a formula. It aids analysis. It doesn't drive us to any particular conclusions. It is a way of, of thinking about the present situation, thinking about uh, governmental responses, and thinking about whether these are appropriate. It's a tool of analysis. Uh, we're not going to have a mathematical formula which allows us to say precisely whether governments are acting appropriately or inappropriately, but proportionality can help us, I think, um, think critically and analytically about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and governmental responses to it. And proportionality, of course, has uh, four prongs, uh, the first being legitimacy, where we ask if 
the state is pursuing a legitimate or pressing and substantial objective. I don't think anyone would particularly doubt that responding to COVID-19 is a legitimate state objective. Uh, defining the objective is, is important, um, but also difficult. And this, I think, is, is where uh, legitimacy and the proportionality test as an analytical tool are useful. Um, and we can see already some uh, slippage in governmental definitions of what exactly the objective is. Uh, are we looking to eliminate uh, COVID-19 uh, completely, or are we looking to minimize the harm from COVID-19? That might seem like a small difference, but I think in, in reality, uh, both in uh, public health terms and in legal terms, the, dif the difference between eliminating uh, the pandemic or the, the, the disease which uh, has uh, caused the pandemic, or the virus which has caused the pandemic, and simply minimizing harm are two very different things. It's one thing to to flatten the curve, to bring down the rate of transmission and the rate of, rate of retransmission. Um, quite another to keep Canadians safe or to make sure that there is little or no risk involved uh, before the economy can reopen and people can return to go about their daily business. Um, flattening the curve is, is one thing uh, which can be uh, achieved. Uh, it doesn't mean that the virus has been uh, driven out completely. Um, keeping Canadians safe is a more uh, demanding objective, which of course would justify more intrusive and more far-reaching and more wide-ranging uh, government powers in response. And of course, we have to think about rational connection. Is there a rational connection between the objective being pursued and the measures being used to pursue it? Uh, as with legitimacy, I don't think people would quibble too much about the rationality of the connection between uh, the general governmental response uh, and the uh, objective being pursued, whether that's flattening the curve or eliminating uh, risk, uh, there is uh, typically going to be a rational connection between governmental responses and um, the objective being pursued. But again, uh, rational connection is usually a an easy hurdle to get over in uh, in judicial review cases, uh, but here uh, certainly uh, at points uh, governments might uh, trip over it. Um, so if we think about essential services, again, there's no no real doubt that shutting down um, uh, businesses which are not essential is rationally connected to uh, eliminating or minimizing the risk from COVID-19. Nonetheless, when you look at the lists of essential services, you might find yourself posing questions about the basis for the distinction between some businesses which are allowed to stay open and others which are required to remain shut. In the United States, there have been uh, constitutional challenges to orders requiring gun stores and churches to close uh, or to um, at least not to have people physically present on their premises. Of course, these aren't classic rational connection or rational basis cases because the services involved there are constitutionally protected. But if you look at the way the courts reason through these cases, they look at what makes a gun store different from a liquor store, or what makes a church different from a hardware store or a grocery store. Uh, and so questions of rational basis and rational connection uh, can be helpful in thinking about the way governments are responding. Uh, equally, uh, economic measures have been an important aspect of governmental responses to the crisis. I think, again, probably is a, a rational connection between the Bank of Canada extending quantitative easing uh, and um, Parliament of Canada providing plenary powers to the Minister of Finance to create a Crown Corporation. Uh, that satisfies the, uh, the rational basis test. Uh, but again, um, we might want to question at the margins uh, whether there is a, a rational basis for all of these measures. Move then to the necessity prong of the proportionality test, which is typically in judicial review cases, at least, where the action is. Uh, we ask whether the state action is necessary to achieve the objective. 
In a human rights case, we'll ask whether the measures were minimally impairing of any rights which have been infringed, uh, or uh, in general terms, if we're thinking about proportionality as an analytical tool rather than as something that courts use in judicial review cases, well, we might ask whether simply there are alternative or less dramatic means of achieving the objective or whether there are safeguards that could be put in place. Uh, Necessity is obviously a part of the proportionality test. Um, when you look at framework legislation for dealing with emergencies, things like the uh, Canadian legislation that David was talking about in the United Kingdom, the Civil Contingencies Act, necessity tends to be built in in some way to the framework legislation and executives are not empowered to act uh, under the authority given an emergency legislation without satisfying some sort of necessity requirement. Um, so uh, already necessity is with us uh, in the emergency context. And I think it's uh, useful, uh, useful as part of the proportionality test and as an analytical uh, device to scrutinize government action. Uh, now, um, people will say, as soon as one raises the issue of necessity, the issue of the margin of appreciation, and of course, in the context of an emergency, a public health emergency uh, like this one, there's going to be quite a bit of deference, uh, quite a bit of a, a margin of appreciation uh, given to governments uh, who are in a good position to respond. They have access to information. Uh, they're able to, to move quickly and may need to move quickly in the context of a public health crisis. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a margin of appreciation is not a blank check. And necessity as an analytical tool uh, should drive us, I think, uh, or, or well, can't drive us or compel us to a particular conclusion. But I, I think it does suggest that measures uh, should be put into new legislative powers and new regulatory powers which are given to governments uh, to make sure that they are not, uh, they don't go any further than is necessary to deal with the crisis at hand. Things like sunset clauses, um, which provide that legislation expires at a certain date unless it has been reauthorized or reenacted, are one useful means of ensuring that. Um, uh, governments use only power or given only powers that are necessary to deal with the crisis. Um, in the Canadian uh, economic uh, emergency legislation, uh, there is a sunset clause which expires later this year. It doesn't apply to the, uh, the Crown Corporation, um, but uh, it does apply to the uh, ability to uh, raise money um, and tax and spend um, um, under the uh, emergency provisions. You might also have preconditions in legislation uh, which have to be satisfied before particular powers can be exercised. Uh, and you may also provide for oversight provisions that parliamentary committees have to be uh, able to scrutinize governmental action uh, using emergency powers uh, and that governments have to provide information about how they're using those powers in order to facilitate parliamentary scrutiny and public debate. So there, even if governments have a large margin of appreciation, it's not a blank check. And the necessity uh, prong of the proportionality test suggests that safeguards ought to be put in place. Uh, I also, would also say that as the pandemic drags on, uh, and it seems like it's going to drag on for some time, unfortunately, uh, uh, the questions of necessity uh, are going to get harder and questions of whether there are alternative and less dramatic means of achieving one's objective are also going to become uh, more pressing uh, as the, the economic pain continues and as some of the, uh, perhaps as there are more intrusions and more targeted intrusions on individuals' uh, civil liberties, the harder questions will be asked about uh, whether these measures are truly necessary to achieve their objectives. The last prong of the proportionality test is the, the fair balance 
prong. And the question here is whether the public interest in uh, fighting off COVID-19 uh, is uh, balanced appropriately with the interference with individual interests that has uh, been, uh, been affected by uh, government measures. There are various interests at stake, and some of these are going to change over time. Um, bodily integrity uh, is at issue uh, in regimes where there's any sort of mandatory testing. Uh, privacy interests obviously are engaged as soon as we get into the realm of tracking and tracing people who might have been exposed to the virus, uh, perhaps using smartphones and other technologies to, to track people down. Um, if people are tracked down and have to be quarantined, uh, that in impacts on individuals' personal liberty. Uh, already the Quarantine Act does that, uh, but um, there may be further measures when uh, we're trying to reopen economies and we're trying to stamp out isolated outbreaks of COVID-19. It might be necessary to engage in mandatory testing, track and trace, and quarantine. Um, now that um, uh, raises the issue of fair balance. It also raises issues about necessity. Um, economic freedom, of course, uh, is at stake. Um, businesses have been closed, um, which means that people can't uh, go uh, and engage in commerce. And uh, critically, many people cannot uh, work uh, in their chosen field of employment. And finally, there are property interests at stake. Businesses being closed, they have property interests at stake. Um, and travel restrictions as well that prevent people from traveling. And so the question when we think about fair balance is whether the, the public interest in fighting COVID-19 and uh, making or trying to um, ensure that as few people die as possible um, or, or, or fall ill and, and suffer the, uh, the consequences of, of hospitalization and, and perhaps a, a slow recovery to full health, uh, whether that public interest is uh, is outweighed by interference with uh, individual interests in bodily integrity uh, and so on. Um, lastly, um, thinking about proportionality, as I noted at the outset, we tend to think about proportionality in terms, in Canada at least, in terms of the charter. Certainly there's a possibility of charter challenges. Um, I'd say before uh, leaping straight to uh, legitimate objective, rational connection, necessity and fair balance, uh, we shouldn't forget that any restrictions must also be prescribed by law, which is an important safeguard, which is sometimes skipped over in uh, discussion and even in some, uh, in some court cases, um, the limits have to be set out by law. They have to be uh, foreseeable uh, so that people can uh, plan their affairs uh, knowing whether or not the law is likely uh, to limit what they can do. Um, but I would caution, however, that any judicial involvement in responding to the COVID-19 crisis is likely to be limited, and that's because of the, the nature of the governmental responses. If we think about uh, the use of imperium and the very broad powers that the provinces are currently exercising in respect of uh, public health emergencies, those are very broad powers. Uh, but in the Canadian uh, Constitution, uh, the permissibility of delegating plenary powers to ministers um, has been long established. Um, and I think it's unlikely that courts uh, are going to change course uh, in the context of this pandemic. Uh, if we think about dominium, contracting and distributing largesse, uh, generally this is not subject to uh, judicial review. I say generally advisedly, there are certainly cases at the margins where courts might get involved, but this is not an area where courts have typically been very active. Uh, lastly, the provision of information and guidance and non-binding soft law being used to structure government policy, that too uh, often escapes judicial review. And so there's, uh, it's, it's likely that there's not going to be very much for courts to get their teeth into uh, in terms of the governmental responses to COVID-19.
of course, the, the courts are laboring, as David says, uh, under uh, significant constraints at the moment. Uh, but I think the, uh, the general rules and principles of judicial review um, are unlikely to, uh, to bite uh, on um, many of the governmental responses. Um, but I wouldn't, that, that's not a, a counsel of despair. Um, I would say that proportionality, even if we're not uh, invoking it uh, as a legal tool in determining the what governments can do and what they can't do, uh, it can be a, a useful analytical tool in public and political debate. And the ideas of rational connection, rational basis, necessity, and so on are uh, tools which members of the public and politicians can readily grasp. Uh, and I think uh, lawyers, public lawyers, have a role to play in using uh, proportionality to better explain uh, what's going on and what some of the, the dangers are uh, as we move forward through the pandemic. I have some written some uh, further thoughts on uh, various aspects of uh, this presentation on proportionality, on forms of power, um, and um, uh, on governmental responses to COVID-19. And you can see, can't you, that I say uh, NB update link when available on Tuesday. Um, I forgot to take that line out of the PowerPoint slide. Um, but it is, uh, it is live now on, um, on, my, um, uh, on my website, Administrative Law Matters. Um, and uh, you can also look, uh, there's some other uh, excellent blog resources, uh, the UK CLA blog, uh, Frasson's blog, as uh, David mentioned, and of course the Centre for Constitutional Studies blog. Um, blogs uh, allow legal academics to engage very quickly and rapidly with the, the public, um, and I think they're having, I think they're having a, a very, uh, uh, they're having a very important effect on uh, public and political discourse at the moment. Um, so I encourage you to look at, uh, at these resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. So um, here we are now uh, at the point in our, in our presentation where uh, we are going to look to our uh, audience for questions. And we have a number of questions that have come in already. And uh, David, you may have had an opportunity to take a look at them. I'm not certain if you have, but Paul, because you've been speaking, you have not. So I thought perhaps we might begin by asking a question that deals specifically with uh, David's talk. And um, that is uh, with respect to Schmidt. And um, so this question says, uh, so directed at David, to what extent is the Schmittian hypothesis that is the sovereign is she or he who decides the exception, qualified by political culture. In the US, for example, we see over the last several years that legal mechanisms appear to be often ineffective against dictatorial tendencies due to sharp political instabilities in the underlying culture. Perhaps to restate my question, says the uh, asker, to what extent are legal constitutional controls overwritten by uh, political culture? I, I did have a chance to look at the questions and I read that one. So uh, the uh, last line is underwritten by political culture. And uh, I think that uh, the answer to that question is uh, that to a large extent, legal constitutional controls are underwritten by political culture. And uh, when, when I gave a talk uh, last week for uh, uh, University of Toronto alumni, not on directly on COVID, but on Trump and the rule of law and the rise of a liberal democracy. I ended that talk with a, a slide from, uh, with a quotation from the great American judge, uh, Leonard Hand. So this is uh, a speech that he gave in 1944. And uh, Hand says, uh, what do we mean when we say that first of all, we seek liberty? I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws and upon courts. These are false hopes, believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court uh, to save it. And uh, this uh, passage from Learned Hand Speech has always uh, stuck with me because it does seem to me that uh, ultimately our guarantee is uh, political culture, 
and that's what does underwrite uh, legal culture. And if uh, the, that political culture, let's call it a culture of legalism and constitutionalism, uh, wanes, then it doesn't matter uh, how great our uh, written constitution is, how great our institutional structure of courts happens to be, uh, we will find that uh, we uh, will, will gravitate towards uh, autocracy. And one can see this, I think, uh, illustrated in Hungary, because the uh, it, uh, Orban's version of the Enabling Act is the culmination of years of work to undermine what seemed in the 1990s to be a thriving legal culture in uh, Hungary with a, a very active constitutional uh, court. And uh, I think for many of us, the, the way in which uh, legal institutions have not uh, been able to withstand uh, the onslaught of uh, Trumpism has been a source of some despair. Now, I worry a little bit about that quote because uh, when people wrote to me after uh, the webinar in which I presented uh, the talk on Trump and the rule of law, they pointed out that in the United States of America, if we talk about the love of liberty, those people who are standing with automatic weapons uh, guarding uh, to two parlors that are opening up in uh, some states, think that they are the guardians of the Constitution and it's in their hearts that the love of liberty lies, not in uh, the hearts of uh, those uh, Democrats. So I, I, I do think that this question about political culture is a very troubling question and uh, I really don't have a, an answer uh, to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, difficult question to answer. Um, so we have s many questions coming in, so I'm just going to uh, pick one here and as I've said to our to our presenters if they see a question that they completely want to answer uh, just please interrupt me but I'm going to uh, ask you the question about uh, negative versus positive rights much of this discussion has concerned the potential for government to infringe negative rights in the course of actively responding to an emergency but do we have moral or legal rights for government to act positively so as to respond to an emergency? For instance, if the state were to fail to implement measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 among uh, vulnerable communities within homeless shelters or long-term care facilities, is that, would that be considered unconstitutional? So is this an opportunity for us to take a look at some of our charter rights and look at uh, positive rights for governments, for example? Well, I'd certainly, um, I would have no quarrel with the idea that uh, government has a, a moral obligation um, in respect to uh, people in, in long-term care facilities or, or homeless shelters. Um, and it's not implausible either that they might have a legal obligation. Certainly in the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, there are uh, positive obligations on the state to uh, ensure um, uh, respect for, for life. Um, in Canada, slightly more difficult, and I think the, the route is, is probably Section 7, um, and it would be, uh, it would take uh, the development of a, a detailed factual record which demonstrates that uh, governments have been failing uh, in in respect of homeless shelters or long-term care facilities, um, you know, theoretically and conceptually, there's no there's no barrier to doing that. Um, the difficulty is in um, developing the factual record which would support such a challenge. But it's certainly not um, certainly not unthinkable, uh, not not unthinkable at all. I would have said. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, David? I know. Um, so I was going to go to the first question, or one of the earlier questions, uh, which is uh, uh, specifically addressed at Professor Dysonhouse. And it says, Professor Dysonhouse addressed all levels of government, but not First Nations government. I'm wondering if he has any comments on the regulation allowing First Nations to extend their own terms in office. For example, the First Nations election cancellation and postponement regulations. Um, and, and then the uh, the person asking this question has cited a particular section of this, uh, of this regulation. The Council of a First Nation, whose chief or councillors are chosen according to the custom of the First Nation, may extend the term of office of the chief and councillors if it is necessary to prevent, mitigate, or control the spread of diseases on its reserve, uh, even if the custom does not provide for such a situation. So any comments on that, David or Paul? Well, I'm somewhat hampered by the fact that this is the first time I've uh, heard of this regulation. 
No, it's certainly a very interesting uh, regulation. And I, th I think it raises uh, a, a problem that uh, transcends uh, the Canadian context. And one of the worries that uh, has emerged in the last couple of months in the United States of America is if uh, Trump uh, decides that uh, the election uh, isn't looking too uh, good for him, will he try to use the current uh, public health crisis to postpone the election until he uh, feels more assured that he's going to be elected to a second term uh, of office? And I, th I think that there, there is a kind of genuine problem there because it, it is difficult to uh, hold an election during a public health crisis. And uh, one can see that various uh, uh, solutions to the problems that are caused by the public health crisis seem, at least in the United States, to uh, favor uh, either uh, Democrats or Republicans or people divide on partisan lines about how to manage an election. And there might be good reason, I, th I think, at times to postpone having an election. But if one does postpone uh, the election and it allows uh, those in power to extend their term of office, then we do away with a very important and maybe the most important uh, mode of accountability. So I do think that that uh, question uh, raises very serious problems. And uh, like the first, I'm afraid, I don't have uh, an easy answer to it. The um, I think it's a it's an excellent uh, question, um, and um, I did um, I, I for me too. It's the first time I've seen this particular provision, um, um, and it seems to be made under Section seventy three and seventy six of the Indian Act and Section forty one of the First Nations Election Act. Um, now, what I think this uh, I mean, if you go to those provisions you will see that there are very general provisions which relate to the holding of elections. Uh, there is no mention particularly of public health emergencies uh, in those sections. The only reference that I saw in my, my quick uh, skim there uh, was one reference to sanitary conditions during, uh, during an election. And so the question that uh, you have to pose uh, here is whether this regulation is uh, ultra vires uh, or or not. The, uh, the statutes that it's uh, authorized, the statutes that um, it references, uh, under the power in the Indian Act and under the power in the um, the First Nations Elections Act, uh, can the governor and council, uh, that's the federal cabinet, by the way, uh, can they issue regulations providing for uh, extensions of terms of office? Um, now, the problem this raises, which is also a transcendent problem, is that many governments uh, around the world have used uh, public health statutes, um, which seem, when you read them, if you read, for example, the United Kingdom legislation uh, under which uh, the UK was locked down, um, it seems you know, pretty clear, maybe you could argue it uh, one way or the other, but it seems pretty clear that that legislation is about specific identifiable individuals who might have a communicable disease. And in that case, uh, you can make regulations or make decisions requiring them to remain in their homes. Um, but uh, what we have instead is uh, what the, the government uh, erected on this pretty narrow foundation uh, is a broad and sweeping measure requiring everyone uh, to stay in their homes. Um, and uh, I think many of the, um, many of the, the lockdown provisions in, in many countries um, are vulnerable to those ultra vires type challenges. Are the, the regulations actually within the powers that have been granted to governments and ministers? I think in the Canadian, uh, in the Canadian context, I think the, the, the public health orders are, are, are mostly um, on a fairly solid legal basis. Um, but, that, uh, but this sort of measure, it's the first time I've seen this particular measure, um, immediately raises questions about vires, immediately raises questions about whether governments are using uh, powers in an appropriate way. Are they using uh, narrow powers to achieve broad objectives? And that's something they, they shouldn't be doing and, and courts uh, should be willing to uh, strike down uh, if they think governments have outstepped the limits on their, their powers. Thank you. Well, on the issue of courts, there are a couple of questions here about those. And so I'm just going to ask this question. Uh, give, given the aspects of the use of emergent, emergency powers by the state and ongoing legal disputes, 
should courts not be taking a more active role that is be deemed an essential service and continue to hear cases, keep the oversight while observing adequate safeguards. So should there be more of a demand uh, to, to keep the courts open? I know in Alberta, there has been a, a discussion around make, you know, the courts are deemed essential services, why aren't they open, that sort of thing. Well, I certainly think uh, the courts are essential services. Um, I think uh, uh, many legal proceedings can, uh, can proceed in writing or electronically, over the phone, by video conference. It's not that difficult. Um, and I think, frankly, that uh, Canadian courts could take a leaf out of the book of Canadian administrative tribunals, uh, which have been using written proceedings and video conferencing and telephone uh, to great effect for many years, uh, long before this crisis, and demonstrating that it's certainly possible um, to uh, conduct business as usual uh, via remote means. David, did you want to weigh in on that? I, I think I'll just say, and this follows on some of my remarks about uh, why uh, there are certain dangers in a public health crisis that uh, may not arise in uh, a more uh, explicitly political crisis. And, and, and that is, uh, we, we might uh, tend to uh, take uh, too much for granted uh, the, what our uh, authorities are telling us. So that if they tell us that uh, courts are going to operate only on an emergency basis, we uh, might accept that without really thinking about the kinds of factors that Paul uh, just outlined. And at a certain point, we have to try to get back to uh, life uh, in some kind of uh, normal uh, fashion. And perhaps there should be a more public uh, demand for services like court services to resume when there don't really seem to be uh, serious obstacles to the resumption of uh, that service. And I, I just had a quick question myself just on this issue. Um, you know, I think back to World War II and uh, the income, people beginning or the, the decision that was made by the government to impose income tax, assuring the Canadian populace that, that uh, after the war was over, it, it would disappear. And of course it never did. And so some of the changes that are being made both at the, both at the federal and at provincial levels and uh, will not, inevitably, I would imagine, stay with us over the course of time. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about walking back some of these, uh, well, I'll call them encroachments. And, um, you know, we, we certainly have seen some in our, at a, at certainly at provincial levels, where governments have taken on um, powers that seem quite um, extensive, shall we say. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, or is that too broad a question? I, th I think it's a very interesting question and uh, how one answers it might depend a lot on uh, one's own uh, political uh, perspective. <laughs> so so it's, it's yeah. from, from my perspective, uh, it was of great benefit to uh, the public that out of both the First World War and, and uh, more uh, prominently the Second World War, there arose a sense that uh, collective action of a certain sort could be well done by uh, the state. So the state responds to a wartime emergency, marshals uh, resources, puts in place officials who are going to try to run things in as efficient a fashion as possible. And people start to think, well, maybe the state can deliver uh, goods to us that we uh, can't have if we don't have uh, the state involved. And uh, to the extent that some people, and I would count myself in this group, see some kind of silver lining in the current public health crisis, it is that uh, the public might uh, reawaken to a sense of uh, the good things that the state can do uh, after a time when uh, in the era of what we might call uh, neoliberalism, there has been an onslaught on uh, the state. And actually things could go in the other direction. And I think certainly Republicans in the United States of America are uh, reluctant to have uh, the federal government uh, 
uh, be more proactive because they don't want people to be uh, awakened to this uh, thought that maybe the state can uh, do some good in our lives as well as being uh, a threat about which we should be vigilant. I think um, there are, I think I make two observations. One is about sunset clauses, which I mentioned as a means of making sure that government responses don't go on for longer than is necessary. But there is a, there's a limit with, with sunset clauses. Uh, you can put them in, but sometimes uh, if programs are being rolled over, legislation is being rolled over or, or reauthorized, the debates around sunset clauses tend to become pro forma and they rubber stamp something. Um, and it's certainly possible that some of the economic uh, responses um, could go the same way, that we just end up, uh, there might be sunset clauses, but we end up uh, rubber stamping them, um, rubber stamping these measures, and they, they continue um, indefinitely. Um, the second thing I'd say is that uh, in terms of this crisis in particular, certainly um, you, you, one looks at um, long-term care facilities uh, in Ontario and Quebec and the, um, uh, the, the dreadful uh, death uh, rates uh, that one sees in those institutions. It's hard to, uh, hard to avoid the possibility that the, the federal government will accrue um, powers in respect of long-term health care um, for the elderly um, that it has not had previously. Thank you. Okay, we have a number of, of questions here. Right? And again, if, if either one of you sees a question that you would really like to answer, please uh, just interrupt me because uh, we do have a number of them here. Um, I was thinking about this one. Uh, the principle of necessity described by Professor Daly has already been reduced in Canadian judicial reasoning pre-pandemic to a reasonableness test. Uh, that is, did the government make a reasonable choice between the available alternatives? Is there a danger that this already deferential standard will become doubly deferential, that is, essentially a judicial abdication in attempts to have courts hold governments accountable for overly broad re restrictions on liberty during the pandemic? Yeah, I think that's, um, if you look at the, the history of uh, the common law, um, some, um, some of the most um, um, disreputable precedents, like Liversidge and Anderson, a um, famous uh, House of Lords decision, uh, there are wartime cases where uh, the courts felt that they had to give uh, executives a large margin of appreciation. Uh, in the Canadian context, the leading cases on delegation uh, Ray Gray and the, uh, the chemicals case, uh, their wartime cases about wartime measures. Um, and the idea accepted today that governments, uh, sorry, that um, uh, parliament and the provincial legislatures can essentially delegate plenary power to ministers with very few safeguards. Um, they, uh, the, the, that idea is traceable to those wartime decisions. So there, um, as Professor Ryder says, um, proportionality review can already be quite deferential. The necessity prong can be very demanding, but it can also be applied in a very deferential way, uh, giving a, a large margin of appreciation to governments. Uh, and there's certainly a, a risk that if a challenge were taken to a particular measure, um, that the courts would end up um, fearful of the, the consequences of holding otherwise uh, being more deferential than they should. I would hope that the courts um, would, um, uh, would realize that any, any precedent of that nature um, would linger and uh, would doubtless uh, come to be viewed as a, um, a, as a poor decision. Um, I certainly hope that they'd uh, hold fast, uh, stick to their guns and uphold the rule of law. Um, but certainly there's a danger uh, that in times of crisis or pandemic, um, that uh, courts will be unduly deferential to executives. Thank you. Um, well, here's a kind of a broad question. What does the past teach us about how to deal with attempts to make China an international enemy, which has significant consequences and risks for domestic states and their members who are of Asian descent? Well, I, th I think the past uh, tells us that uh, we should be uh, very wary <laughs> of uh, such uh, attempts. Uh, May, may, may I say that one of the uh, 
pleasures in doing this webinar is that uh, from both looking at the list of uh, people uh, at attending it and also people who are asking the questions, it's a pleasure to see uh, uh, many old friends in these days of uh, social isolation. So Mary, I, th I think that is a, a great question, but I, I wonder whether uh, you think that uh, perhaps it's a question that's uh, more uh, directed at the moment at the United States of America than at, at Canada. Of course, it's the case in Canada that if one thinks back to uh, the Second World War and the way that the Canadian government and Canadians in general uh, treated uh, Canadians of uh, Japanese descent, then uh, we shouldn't be too uh, sanguine about our, uh, our uh, inability in Canada to uh, find an other whom we can make uh, the enemy in order to deflect attention from our, uh, our own uh, problems. Certainly in the United States of America, a, a large uh, element in Trump's uh, re-election strategy seems to be trying to move attention from uh, the enemy in the COVID virus mm -hmm. to an international enemy that is China. And then one can see the kind of uh, move from a public health emergency to a more uh, kind of Schmittian understanding of uh, the distinction in politics as being the distinction between friend and enemy, and then finding a clear enemy against whom uh, you can direct your ire in order to mobilize political support within. So I do think that there is a real danger. And uh, as I said, it is a danger that uh, Canadians have experienced in their own past, but it doesn't seem to me at present to be a particularly troubling element within the Canadian political order. Did you want to... uh, not particularly. I mean, the, the only the only thing that springs to mind is the um, Dr. Tam uh, Teresa Tam, the, um, the public health official, has received some criticism for her uh, her advice in uh, earlier parts of this year when there were questions about travel restrictions from from China. Um, and uh, she explained um, that uh, you know you have to balance the the public health consideration, which is that uh, you uh, don't want to import um, the, the the virus um, with uh, considerations relating to uh, to racism. Um, so if you're if the government is very publicly uh, shutting down flights from China or from some other region, um, that sends the message which uh, some people might act on negatively. Um, as a, as an administrative lawyer, um, what that episode uh, tends to reveal. To me, is that uh, decisions about uh, decisions that experts take uh, in times of crisis or uh, at any other time um, are often not simply uh, technical uh, judgments, um, but often involve questions of, of fact and uh, value judgment, um, which um, uh, are enmeshed with the application of, of technical expertise, um, which is something um, which can raise accountability challenges. Um, we've seen uh, politicians work very closely with public health officials uh, during the crisis. Um, and sometimes uh, I think um, the public health officials have perhaps uh, uh, risked or crossed uh, the line between um, um, between public health and um, and political judgment. And that's something to be vigilant about, that, that these people are experts, um, but their, their expertise uh, does not mean that everything they say is uh, um, a product of their expertise. There are often um, policy judgments, value judgments, which are uh, enmeshed uh, in their uh, applications of their expertise. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to take one last question. And um, Now, does, does either of you have a question that you absolutely want to answer before I select one? Well, I, I did see that, uh, that Michael Weibel um, had, asked, uh, had asked me a question. Uh, Guten Abend, Michael. Um, I hope all is well in Vienna. 
Um, and um, the, the question is about the, the German Constitutional Court and the, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, which have been involved in a very public spat recently about uh, quantitative easing uh, and proportionality. And, and Michael asks uh, uh, whether uh, the review of one highest court's proportionality assessment, the, the European Central Bank's, um, uh, can be reviewed by uh, another um, highest court, uh, the German Constitutional Court. Um, and I think the concern in, in Michael's question is well placed, that proportionality uh, is not a mathematical formula. It's an analytical tool that can help us uh, draw conclusions, but uh, it can't compel particular conclusions. And I did think that uh, the German Constitutional Court uh, seems to have gone a little bit over the top uh, in uh, the ECB case. Um, uh, if I don't think the German Constitutional Court has to defer to the uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, but I think considerations of of comity, of respect between uh, different courts, um, should have led it to be uh, much more measured, if not mute, uh, in its criticism. Thank you, David. Was there a question that you felt uh, compelled to answer? There's so. Many here. I, I, nothing that I feel compelled uh, to answer. I know they're I right. I would just remark about, uh, not about Michael's question, but about, a remark about the weird time that we're living through. So when I saw Michael's uh, name on the list of uh, questions, it reminded me that uh, we saw each other in uh, New York uh, two and a half months ago. I think we were on the same panel uh, at, him at uh, New York University. And now it seems like that was uh, 10 years ago, because this was kind of time before time. And uh, it is quite hard, I think, uh, uh, during this epidemic to get a hold on uh, reality. Indeed, indeed. Well, perhaps that's the, the place that we should end our, uh, our webinar today. I want to uh, thank you both very much for agreeing to, to present. And I'm just thinking that Perhaps in a year from now, we can come back and take a look at how the world has changed from a legal standpoint and, and uh, you know, where we are in terms of uh, government action and having been able to, as I said earlier, sort of walk back or consider the proportionality aspects of some of the decisions that have been made in the context of this, this health uh, crisis. But in any event, I want to thank you both very, very much for your uh, presentations. Very, very interesting. And certainly all of the comments we've received through our question and answer have uh, commented on, on the fact that people have really enjoyed your presentations. I also would like to thank uh, Alina Ritzma, who is the Public Legal Education Coordinator for the Centre, for the work that she's done behind the scenes to organize this event and uh, to ensure that everything ran very smoothly. I'd like to thank the audience for participating uh, in the webinar. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. And, um, and to remind you uh, of a couple of things. First of all, that the webinar has been recorded and so you will be able to see it on our website. And also we would really appreciate it if you filled out this little survey that's going to pop up after this webinar closes because so we do uh, appreciate your feedback. It's critical to our funding actually and also to our uh, future programming. So thank you all very, very much. And uh, with that, I'm just going to press this end button and uh, say uh, à la prochaine, merci beaucoup. Thank you.